All right. So now we have our next group coming in. Uh, this is so exciting and so difficult and so challenging. And I'm so excited to welcome in our next group. We are talking about farming. We have four fabulous guests. Thank you for coming in, you guys. It's great to see you all. Can you all see and hear everything okay? Yay. Yay. Yep. So we're talking about fabulous farming. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> now, fabulous. I've had all of you guys on uh, the show at different times talking about your own thing. Uh, why don't you introduce what you're kind of excited about, what's going on with you now, what are you growing? Uh, let's start with Heather. Heather, you're first. Okay. Um, I have decided to try and I made some decisions about not trying to grow everything because I always in spring, okay, actually February, I'm over snow, I've got nothing to do, I'm housebound and I make amazing plants. Okay, I'm going to flip this bed every six weeks, I'm going to grow this and then this and then this and it works for like two weeks. <laughs> then I wear myself out and so I've decided that it's not sustainable if I can't sustain it. So this year, I mean, like, what do I enjoy growing? What grows well where I am? Um, and then, you know, what do people like um, that I grow? So I'm really focusing in on rhubarb, butternut pumpkins, um, wheat, rice, and Roma tomatoes for people who like to make their own tomato sauce. Um, and it's been a bit this i still grow the rest of the veg i grow all of our vegetables so i'm still growing but i'm not growing heaps and i've got lovely people saying hey heather i haven't seen your veggie boxes and i've just been, i can't i can't i'm one person <laughs> and i find veggie boxes really stressful um because i don't deliver them because mine go by a post it always means i can't put in lettuce i can't put in things that don't uh, travel well and i feel like when i first started doing it there weren't a lot of people doing it so i felt like i was really providing something that um there was a gap in the market and now i see amazing people doing it in all different places in japan and producing great boxes and i'm just like you know everyone has their thing that they can do and without feeling stressed and that's not mine so but i think it was a big like pulling back from something is something i find really difficult like i think i don't know whether it's like admitting failure or um, I don't know. I just I find it that very difficult. But I was like, you know. <laughs> so yeah. So the, uh, sorry, that was kind of a long answer. But yeah, for me, it's been um, making using my head and not my heart to make decisions. <laughs> I think that's really important. And I think Chuck, Thomas, now you guys can all identify with how Heather's feeling. Uh, Chuck, how about you? What's what are you growing now? What are you excited about? Um. Yeah, I was gone for three months. I was in Hokkaido, uh, just weird twist of fate. And I had volunteers caring for my farms and they did a fabulous job. My heartfelt thanks to you all. And I've got some 125 tomato plants, 11 heirloom varieties. And I totally hear you, Heather. What the heck was I thinking? <laughs> my God, I'm not an amateur. I'm a, I'm a farm, but oh yeah. I'm just killing myself trying to. You must it. spend a week every week tying up the new shoots. <laughs> the suckers, and tying up the shoots. Yeah. But anyway, what I'm excited about is like you're growing uh, the traditional butternuts. I have honey nuts this year, which are the smaller okay. variety. I'm very excited about that. Um, and yeah, just everybody asks, what's your favorite thing to go? What do you like? Best? I don't have a favorite. People ask me today, and I was like, you know, I just love it all. Um, but I do love the winter squash because they keep so long. I've still got butternut on the shelf from last year, so that's a real winner. But for me, um, the thing I'm most excited about is my new program at the farm, um, which I don't have to talk about right now because maybe we're talking about growing things and everything, but I want to hear what everybody else has to say, so I'm just going to pass the mic. Yeah, connecting with events and education, we'll, we'll dive in in a few other minutes. Thanks. No worries. Yeah. No worries. Uh, Thomas, you want to go next? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my name's uh, Thomas Klepfer, for those listening at home, and um, it's good to be with you all. Uh, yeah, for this year, uh, you know, we're growing probably 20, 30 varieties uh, right now, like main, mainly cucumbers, beans, pumpkin, tomatoes, 
Um, and I, I'm mostly selling through the like a, like a subscription service at this point and a little bit online with uh, Tapichoku now. Um, but most of my customers, I would say, are, are uh, direct, um, you know, direct, uh, in here on the island, so local, which is really great. Um, we've, we've been running like a CSA through that. Um, so we, today we harvested uh, for that. We did cucumbers and um, uh, peppers and onions and uh, potatoes and uh, everything into the box for them. And then we grow a lot of herbs on the farm too. And um, the way that it, I've done it now is you know through natural farming. So I do have certain things that just a lot of volunteer uh, eguma and uh, shiso that just pops up and new blends of things that you know, I feel like only exists here in in, uh, in Makaishima or on this farm. Uh, cherry tomatoes, another good volunteer that we've got and that I've had since I've had the farm. So we pulled a lot of those out back in May and, and uh, potted them up and planted them up. So that was that's always a nice surprise. It saves a little bit of time and work and effort. But uh, yeah, uh, we're staying busy though. It's getting hot. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely want to talk to all of you about how you're changing what you're growing because of uh, climate change or the weather changes. Uh, mm -hmm. That'll be my next question. Uh, let's get now in here. Now, tell us what you're growing at the moment. How's it going? Hi, my name is Nao. I'm running the Ini Abi farm in Hiroshima. Uh, right now, we just, just harvested the wheat for flowers. We increased the uh, like range of for the weeds this year and I'm so excited to use that flowers for my bread. Actually I went to San Francisco to learn about the, how to bake a sourdough bread and I'm trying to make a good bread. <laughs> yeah. And my and yeah we have twenty more kinds of uh, veggies in my farm. And um um yeah we are trying to sell the vegetables well because in that last four years for us it was difficult time that, that we did, didn't get the enough veggies to make a like you know the veggie box or the stuff to give to the restaurant was like that so we are trying to uh we are focusing on the the, the sell the product this year yeah, thank you. And we started the, officially. We started the Airbnb this year, and you will welcoming guests to help us or just learn how the natural farming is uh, going on our in our farm. Yeah, thank you. Nice to meet you all. Wow, that's great. Uh, you all are in different. Well, Thomas and now you're both in Hiroshima, yeah. but different different areas, kind of different different kind of ecological areas to mountains or or island uh heathers in nagano and chuck you're doing shiga kyoto right correct yeah um so i know all of you are doing quite different things but have you been adjusting like how you're farming because of climate change have you noticed less water more heat those kind of things any strategies that are working well, one thing that I think is probably challenging most of us is insects having uh, a real surge in populations because they get wake up early, there's more generations born and suddenly exponential numbers of this pest arrive and, you know, we're organic. So we've just got to hand pick and manage and go through losses. So I don't know any real solutions to that except waiting for the things that eat those insects or... I just ordered some Castile soap for the the stink bugs. They're just going insane this year. It's this year God. they're they're pretty uh, pretty incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that, that was Heather. A Heather's got a great story about uh, training her kids to pick off bugs and squish them, and <laughs> getting in trouble when they were at nursery school uh, because they were naturally doing that. They weren't supposed to do or something, right? <laughs> she was like, "Look, everyone, it's a little caterpillar," and my three year old went, "I got it." <laughs> <laughs> and the teacher thought she was this hideously violent child <laughs> she just got an organic farmer for her they mom used, they yeah. used to have their little children's <laughs> sand bucket and that was their job just to walk down the rows and pick off the green caterpillars for me so <laughs> but i'm really interested to hear from now i find wheat is getting more challenging because i 
can't get the harvest before the rainy season. I find that I can't predict the beginning of the rainy season as easily as I used to be able to. And two years ago, we almost lost our wheat to, um, I don't know, it's called black tip in English. I don't know what it's called in Japanese, but it was like a, a basically a mold so I'm wondering like have you changed any of the way that you plant or grow wheat because of the unpredictable um, rainy season hi uh, yeah thank you for your question and we are yeah you know the in trouble with the harvesting the weeds and this year for this year only for this year the rainy season was delayed so we were lucky to have all <laughs> with a dried condition but last year it was so difficult and we didn't make it last year so today this year we tried to uh, plant or seed so early and we predicted the seed the uh, days for the harvest and we said that that the, in the beginning of the june so it worked but you know we didn't <laughs> change the raining season mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. under like you know um uh yeah under our discussion like you have yeah it. and it was so uh lucky this year because uh we had time to uh how do you say the peel of the skin with the with, with. just thresh it uh, yeah yeah to before the rainy season so we yeah. all packed the every uh wheat in a paper bag and we <gasps> already uh put inside of the plastic bag and uh get uh the air away uh, out of the plastic bag and we are waiting for the rainy season ends and after that we have to make it to flowers the, Milk. Yeah, mine is still hanging in the field. I I don't think it's drying. Mm. <laughs> wow, it's so difficult. Yeah. 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 Mm. I was wondering about um, the vegetable farmers too. Uh, because of I'm one person, I've always managed to dry farm in the spring. Like I really haven't watered. I mean, when I transplant things, I water. But there's always been enough rain in the spring that I didn't have to water any of my seedlings and. This year, like even my really big established rhubarb was just not handling the really the early hot temperatures. So I'm wondering if you guys have had that problem or if you found a way around, like do you just water all year or how do you deal with a hot early spring? I think, Thomas, you were having issues with watering uh, in the hot season, right, last year? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I on the top part of the farm, because uh, we're on a – uh, what was a citrus orchard at one point and I unless I transplant it I'll water there but we've got several water uh, like large water tanks that we keep but I actually don't do a whole lot of watering uh, especially these days uh, the last few weeks we've gotten, yeah. <laughs> we've gotten a really good um, I really think this year like March April and May were really really wet and really rainy but then I, I've also made the kind of the the decision to hold off on the CSA in August because in Mukaishima uh, or in this part of Japan, we don't get a single day of rain uh, after the rainy season for mm -hmm. about two months. So August and September, it won't, it won't rain at all. So then I'm, I'm trying to do other crops like um, uh, roselle or what, mm -hmm. like rose hips, uh, this kind of, and uh, okra, um, sweet potatoes, these kind of things that, you know, I think can be pretty uh, heat, resistant and tolerant uh kushin sai is another cha like mm -hmm. asian green that's also really heat um tolerant so you know and then what i've done now in the last yeah during that august september time is just give the soil a bit of a rest uh, maybe plant a cover crop uh, or i've been using these really large um tarps and now and uh and i'm tarping a lot of my beds and just you know letting it rest in august and in september and that's been actually really you know, since we can grow year round in Mukaishima, um, we might as well take a take a little bit of a break. You know, I think that's a blessing and a curse, Heather. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do have winters off. Yeah, we. I right hear. 
That's Chuck, Chuck, you're using the tarps to keep the water, uh, watering needs down as well, aren't you? And weeds. Uh, I do, I do. But also, I'm uh, here in Kehoku, Kyoto. It's great. They have the canal system. You know, the mini mm -hmm. canals next to the roads that filter water from the mountain spring as well as from the local river. And I can flood my field almost any time of year. Uh, which is great, absolutely fabulous. But just like everybody here, I'm sure you compost, you compost, you throw a lot of organic matter in your soil so it holds water. I, I don't cover my, my walkways anymore. I let the weeds grow there. That holds a lot of water in that yeah. environment. And the plants find a way, you know, the, the strong plants, they just put those roots down farther and farther. And they do pretty well, yeah. So. I know, it, I mean, talking about the cover, when I visited you, Heather, uh, you were talking, lamenting about the, the plastic and how it gets into everything. And then the thicker plastic, I think, Thomas, you were trying something thicker mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. use longer. Mm -hmm. uh, now, are you using a kind of cover to keep the water and weeds mm -hmm. down? Uh, we just, yeah, we are in trouble with the, the, the kind of things. And we are trying, we are now the covered with they cover the ground with the cut weed. Uh, how do you say? Chop uh, and did, drop. Yeah, we didn't use the plastic ones, but just, uh, you know, we have tons of weeds around the <laughs> field. <laughs> we just, yeah, cut them and chop them yeah, into it. Yeah. Do you use your wheat straw as well? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Because that, that's why we are growing the weeds for the uh, farm, yeah, not only for only for the flo uh, uh, flowers, but we are using floats to the farms very much. Yeah, I think the wheat straw has been amazing in that it can be like August, bone dry, hot, and I stick my finger through the because we just every year we just add another layer. I never remove it, and it's like the most beautiful black soil because it just breaks down year on year, and the temperature difference is incredible. But yeah. um, I would have to, I was like trying to work out how could I get enough wheat straw to cover all the vegetables and stop using plastic. And the secret is I would have to stop growing vegetables so I could grow enough wheat straw, but then I wouldn't have any vegetables. <laughs> and I was like, I could take on another field. No, I cannot take on another field. <laughs> but yeah, I, lo I do love the, the full cycle of you get the flower and then you get the, like uh, the green crop, the, what do you call it? Like the... Like if, because I rotate where I grow the wheat. So you get the green crop to give it a rest and then you get the wheat straw. It's like, it's just a beautiful thing to grow. <laughs> except for the wheat, except for the wet season. <laughs> now uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, getting diverse income sources. So now you mentioned uh, you have a guest house. Uh, Chuck, I know you and Thomas are both also educators. Uh, Heather as well, also teaching as well as, uh, I don't know if that helps a little bit. People always ask, is it possible to make a living as a full-time farmer? Has anyone found it possible or most of you are kind of getting income from different sources as well? Is that right? Yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm very risk averse. And one bad season could really like, I, I, I'm just, yeah, I don't, I don't play lotto. I don't even ride roller coasters. So I, I, and I, in fact, in my neighborhood of like, I don't know, I must know like 30 or 40 farmers. I only know one family that are, that are everyone in the family does not have an outside of farming job. Yeah. So at least one person in every family has a salaried job. And I just feel like, especially with unpredictable seasons and like, un, you know, not being able to rely on it. For me personally, where I live, like not being able to farm in winter, if we have a late frost and I lose all my spring crops, I, I can't just like not pay my bills until I can replant. So yeah, personally, it used to be a goal when I first started. It was, you know, I was like, you're not a real farmer if you have a side job. But um, even other than financially, I, I farm by myself. I, I need, I would go, I would like, I, the, the voices in my head, <laughs> I need to, like, I, I like the social aspect of leaving the field and going and talking. And I mean, I, I love teaching. I don't teach because I have to. I teach because I love it. So, um, yeah. So for me, it's not a goal. But even if I did want to, I would hope my husband stayed as a salary employee. <laughs> I don't think it's too risky. I feel it's too risky in this area for what we farm. 
But I think now, Chuck and, and Thomas, all of you guys are using the farm as a way to bring in people and teach about what you're doing and educate as well, right? And hopefully that brings in a little bit of income as well, like farm tours, uh, farm seminars, that kind of thing, right? Uh, Heather, are you doing that as well? I, you may have noticed when you came here, I get off on tangents and I just go for way too long. <laughs> so the idea of having to do like a half hour tour, we wouldn't have left bed one. <laughs> so, um, I, I've had people who've come to visit and I've showed them around, but I'm, I, yeah, I would need to do a lot of work and really like have a script and have a timekeeper. And uh, I, yeah, it's, I just don't think it's something I'm suited to. I, you would really, people would be going, we were there for an hour and all she talked about was bead shirt. Like we wanted to see stuff. <laughs> and oh, it's yeah. hard to get stuff done too, right? You gotta be yeah, organized. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chuck, you have a great uh, event program happening. Can you tell us about it? Sure. Um, well, I just decided that um, <laughs> I took the year like 2021 to really just farm. Okay, I'm, I'm a farmer now, no, no other side jobs. And no, no, my income was not there. And I was just tossing and turning about it. What should I do? And I just said, well, I've been a teacher for 20 something years. I've been a farmer for 10 or 12 years. Let's put these together and make an English program on the farm. Have families come out on the weekends and the holidays uh, bring their kids and we have a farm experience with nature, the river, food, uh, the environment. Um, we do fun games as well. We have duck races down the little water canals and just get everybody out there and doing and playing and using English in a real way. And at the same time, giving people the opportunity to experience what it's like on a farm, how to be sustainable, kids pulling a carrot out of the ground, washing it and eating it right away. And parents just being like, you don't like carrots, you know, <laughs> and that sort of thing. It just suddenly expanded everything I wanted to is education, sustainability, food, environment, uh, community and education. And I just love, love, love kids. It's just one. They're my favorite group of people in the world. <laughs> so that's awesome. Yeah. And now you often do uh, seminars and invite people to the farm with your your partner, too, right? Yes, yes, we are doing the class for the uh, children and also the adults who want to wants to start the farming by themselves. Uh, it's not have to be the like to be to be, become a farmer, real farmer, or just start it in, in their you know small gardens or small uh, it um, uh, planters. And yeah, we just finished uh, our seminar in this morning and in this afternoon. We are doing the farmer's class in our farm, the main farm, but also in the Hiroshima city central, near the central, uh, to for the people who live in the city central to easy to come and easy to learn, easy to touch the, the natural farming. Yeah, it's helpful is sometimes the participants are helping us and volunteering our work so it's very helpful and we are um, more happy to make the community and share the value of the like this kind of organic farming so we are having fun doing that that's awesome now thomas you might be the only farmer using animals and you also bring people onto the farm and talk about uh, taking care of animals, integrating farming with animals as as well. Uh, you have any interesting projects or events you're you're doing this year? Mm, well, this year we've, uh, um, I think through a connection through mutual connection with Wendy, uh, she's recently sent us uh, the. Uh, spinning machine so we can actually spin our wool and we we've been processing wool every year um cutting it you know in april may so we, we've often hosted workshops for that and got had kids out had groups out to come and do that with our sheep and that's been really great and uh, i look forward to using that um i think here into the future but the other one of the other things with wool is that we can use it in the farm as well uh, i know that uh the kamikiri mushi there's a, a bug that has a lot of damage on trees, especially figs and uh, citrus. And we're using that as a mulch around the uh, citrus as well. So that's something I think the, the oil on it, the natural lanolin uh, uh, on the uh, wool actually can maybe um, work to suppress maybe the bugs 
Uh, so we're, we're trying that. Um, but there's always, yeah. Uh, but right now, I think going into July, August, it's just kind of hanging on or holding on, you know, as it as it heats up. So that's, uh, we'll see how, how we get into fall, though. And you've got animals that eat up your your weeds, weeds and things yeah. Yeah, and we'll process in, it into manure. That's yeah, another we're way, right? sheep. Uh, just moved them to a new space uh, yesterday. And then I'm um, renting some other uh, abandoned farmlands around my, my house now. So we'll move the sheep into the next paddock. And, you know, we, we keep them all rotating around, which is really great. Because I, with all this rain that we're getting, as hot as it gets, the weeds are definitely taken off too. So uh, having the sheep there really uh, makes a big difference. Now, all of you guys are so inspiring and you inspire other people to try even growing some of their own veggies at home. Uh, what you're doing is so important. Uh, do you feel like you can keep going for the next five years or so? And do you see other people taking up farming as well? Are you seeing a trend in the right direction? Because we've had such a decline in farming in Japan for so long, right? Any help out about, there? Mm -hmm. Hearing about NOW's program to teach people farming, I think that's very inspiring. And I know of an, a guy who's doing it here in Kyoto. And I think those are very telling that there are people out there putting the pieces together and making it work uh, to be sustainable and to to give it back and to hand, you know, kind of hand it over to the next generation. And just, again, allowing people access. There are a lot of people want to come out to the farms, as I'm sure everybody here can attest. I know, Heather, you were told you're crazy for trying organic farming from the other farmers. But it sounds like you're winning some people over when I visited, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I would kind of split it in two. I think... Um, People growing their own vegetables, I really think that's increasing. And I, I'm one of those people who every time I'm driving, I promise I look at the road as well. But I always look at people's yards. And I rarely see a house that doesn't have at least like a cucumber, an eggplant, and a tomato. And I love that about Japan. I love how it's not considered something that only professionals or really green thumb people do. Like people just give it a go. Um, but on the other hand... I think like larger scale or like, you know, um, commercial, like commercial farming. I think the average age of farmers like just keeps going up and I don't see a lot of younger generations taking over. I really don't. I see they just keep work, like the older generation just keep working and keep working. Um, and I think more programs to get younger people to come in. Um, they, I, I see them around and, and, and one area is like the organic or at least low chemical or like they're really trying to push that and a lot of younger farmers seem to be interested in that. But what is a little worrying for me is I'm seeing um, like third sector companies, companies that are very much backed by the different levels of government buying up farmland and like mass production of rice, mass production of soba and taking over the apple trees. And I just, I don't know, maybe I'm just old fashioned and romantic, but I feel like owner operators care more about the land and they care more about an individual field and the health of it. And I feel like it's, maybe like I said, it's only in the first couple of years of this, I've been seeing this, but it must be, I would say a quarter of the fields in my neighborhood are now farmed in buckwheat in soba by a company and they've got a little sign like if you see a problem call this number and one time one of their fields was completely flooded because the next door neighbor's rice paddy had you know mm -hmm. and so i did the right thing i called the number and i said hi and they were like uh and i said look this is the field number and this is the issue and i read your little sign like is it causing a hassle to anyone and i said no but like your sober is underwater ah okay thanks for telling us and no one came so to me they're not caring about growing or like the health of it it's just it's and yeah so i guess to me i was kind of like oh these are my new neighbors <laughs> so i hope we can encourage and inspire enough younger people to take over like individual farms and we don't get more and more to factory farming because I think we could look at other countries examples and see that perhaps that's not a road we want to go down yeah now Thomas in your areas are you seeing a bit of progress people getting interested in farming or 
supporting farmers more? Mm. Yeah, no, Namichi, uh, several uh, people who are running their own, like, uh, small businesses, uh, curry shops, uh, have come by uh, multiple times throughout the year, or are, are, are really in the spring. Um, and I do a lot of seed saving, so everybody comes by and you know, asks, you know, what seeds do you have right now? And we're, I'm happy to give all of these seeds away that we've been uh, collecting on the farm, and, um, and just giving them tips and ideas, and uh, they're getting started, and... But they're, uh, you know, just like us on the on the sales side too. That they're, they're struggling with uh, kamemushi, the pests and things too. And you know, we can kind of extra exchange and trade tips and ideas of what maybe we can do. I, I got out the uh, yeah. I got out the makita vacuum the other day to take the. Uh, <laughs> thing. It worked out all right. And then I saw my friend's Instagram the next day, and he was doing the same thing. Oh wow! <laughs> now, me. now, how about in your area? We just have another minute, and then we got to change. Yeah. Uh, in our area, I feel more like uh, people are moving into this area and starting the small farm, which is very good. And I'm inspired from them. Most of them are trying to do that by organic way. So I'm so glad to have that community in my area. And one more thing is I have. Uh, many university students who come to my home and helping us and I feel more and more students are interested in becoming a farmer uh, in the future because of the they uh, started to think about the sustainability or small businesses and they uh, more of them are uh, trying to be a half farmer and half something so which is so nice and I'm always inspired from them and I'm encouraged by them yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's a great place to end it. And thank you guys so much for joining. I want to do a whole hour segment with you guys sometime so we can really dive more deeply into all of these issues. But thank you so much for joining this time. I really appreciate you. Congratulations, Drive 500. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Let's keep going. 500 more, right? <laughs> <laughs> I let you